welcome back to Basic Ornithology. Today we will be talking about bird conservation. Uh, two species of birds have almost certainly gone extinct from India. The Himalayan quail, which was last recorded in 1876, and the pink-headed duck, which was last recorded in 1935. And uh, but a large number of species in India are rare or threatened or endangered and in need of conservation action. If you look at the map of the world and where the rare and threatened species are, you can see that, uh, you know, if, if the area is actually blue, the number of rare or threatened species is low. And if the uh, as you go to a color closer to red through yellow, the uh, number of threatened species in that part of the world is very very high and you can see where the threatened or rare species are these are in uh, the andes mountain range in south america as well as the brazilian atlantic forest where both of which are red and uh, the himalayas in southeast asia but even peninsular india and the rest of india has a large number of threatened and rare bird species which are in need of conservation one of the ways in which we prioritize whether a species is in need of conservation or not is based on the IUCN Red List. The IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And based on certain criteria, the decline in population, the geographic distribution of a species, its population size, and its probability of extinction, the IUCN classifies species into various levels of threat. These are uh, extinct, where the species uh, not not threat, but it's completely gone extinct. Uh, extinct in the wild, where there are no individuals in their natural habitat, but there are certain individuals, some individuals in captivity. Critically endangered, and let's take a look at the critically endangered uh, criterion for just as an example. Uh, the critically endangered species is a species which has declined in population by eighty to ninety percent. Uh, it has a geographical distribution that is between uh, less than 10 to less than 100 square kilometers, uh, between 50 to 250 uh, number of mature individuals, and where the extinction probability is greater than 50% in uh, 10 years or in three generations of the species. So that's what that's the criterion used to uh, classify a species as critically endangered. That's the highest uh, level of threat the highest level of vulnerability of a species, then you have the endangered species, you have vulnerable species, species that are near threatened, that are not yet on the threatened uh, section of the IUCN Red List, but it's likely that they are going to become threatened in the future. And then species that are very common, have large geographic ranges, etc. And those are species that are called least concern or LC species. So there is a wide range of uh, threat levels of species uh, from the IUCN Red List. The most threatened of which are uh, critically endangered species. Uh, India has a number of critically endangered species. The Jordan's Corsa, which was thought to be extinct, but was uh, rediscovered uh, a few decades back. But a large number of other species that are uh, critically endangered, including the gyps vultures at the bottom there, which have become uh, very, very highly endangered because of the uh, veterinary drug diclofenac, uh, which is a toxin for these vultures and has caused their populations to collapse by over 90 98 percent in the last few decades so these are the critically endangered birds that are found in india uh, that are in need of uh, uh, conservation initiatives to make sure that they do not go extinct so why are these species rare why are some species rare uh, it could be a variety of factors one is that these species require specialized habitats uh, for instance alluvial grassland or grassland that is at the terai grassland that is at the uh, foothills of the Himalayas, which is also very, very good for agriculture and has therefore been replaced uh, by agricultural land. And the uh, bird species that specialized on those terai grasslands are therefore some of the most endangered species in the world, They're very, very specialized habitat requirements, and they cannot be found uh, elsewhere. They cannot occur elsewhere. An example of a species like this is the Bengal florican, uh, which is endangered because it's losing a lot of its habitat to agricultural land. Large-bodied species tend to be more uh, likely to be rare than smaller-bodied species. Large-bodied species require uh, large home ranges and large territories, large amounts of resources, and therefore when habitats are uh, destroyed or fragmented, large-bodied species are often the first to go extinct. Uh, species high in the food chain, high, high trophic level species like predators, uh, like raptors, are also uh, especially at risk from uh, you know habitat fragmentation, habitat loss, and so on. Uh, 
obviously some species are rare because they're targeted by hunting or uh, they're losing habitats. Uh, some species could be rare because the, the edge of their geographical ranges, species tend to have uh, high population sizes in the middle of their geographical range. And as you come close to the edge of the geographic range, the population sizes are uh, much smaller. And there could be causes that we just do not know about why some species are rare. But in general, large bodied high trophic level species uh, tend to be rare and uh, also tend to be the first to be uh, affected by any kind of uh, habitat loss or climate change and uh, so on. But there are various types of rarity. All species, all rare species are not identically rare. And uh, we classify these different species uh, uh, in, uh, we classify species into various forms of rarity, the rare species into various types of rarity, depending upon whether the species is a habitat generalist or a specialist, that is the degree of its habitat specialization, whether its local abundance is high or low, uh, that is in its range, does it, does it have high population sizes or small population sizes and whether its geographic range is large or small. And let's look at these different types of rarity here. Here's an example of a widely distributed species, which is a has small local populations, uh, but broad habitat tolerances. So it's found in um, across a broad geographical area, but wherever it's found, it has small populations. And a good example of that is the white rump vulture the lesser atrican stock is also widely distributed. Uh, it has large local populations. Wherever it's found, it is abundant, but it has a narrow habitat tolerance. And that's another kind of rarity uh, that you see in nature. The lesser florican, again, is widely distributed. It has a very narrow habitat tolerance. It's only found in grassland. And wherever it is found, its population sizes are not very high. It has small local populations. Uh, and that's uh, third type of rarity that you see uh, in, in birds. The Nicobar megapod, which is restricted to the Nicobar Islands, has a small geographical range. It's, it's very abundant where it's found and it has a broad habitat tolerance, but because of its small geographic range, it is, uh, it is rare. The black breasted parrotbill has a small geographic range. Where it's found though, it has a large local populations and it is very, very habitat specific. It is restricted to a particular kind of habitat, which is the uh, wet grasslands of uh, Northeast India. And that's the fifth type of rarity. And the sixth type of rarity really is the most, uh, most threatening kind of rarity where you have a very, very highly specialist species found in a very small geographical range. And wherever it's found, uh, it has small local populations uh, and of course, as a specialist, very narrow habitat tolerance is one of the examples of this uh, kind of species is the critically endangered white bellied heron, which is found uh, uh, pretty much only in a few locations in Northeast India. Uh, it is uh, found only in uh, along larger rivers, uh, intermediate sized rivers. And wherever it's found, it's not very uh, abundant. It it's actually has small population sizes. So this is the most threatening form of rarity in that species like this, the sixth form of rarity are the most likely to go extinct. Why is geographical range and small populations so important for the vulnerability of a species? This arises from the process of what is called demographic and environmental stochasticity. Demographic stochasticity is a process where random fluctuations in the birth rates and death rates uh, of a population cause it to uh, increase or decrease in size very, very drastically. When these random fluctuations occur in large populations, they get evened out. And so small populations are particularly vulnerable to demographic stochasticity. Let's say some one year randomly birth rates were very low and death rates were very high. That is going to affect a small population much more than it's going to affect a large population. A large population would be able to recover from these random fluctuations in birth and death rates. But if you have a small population where you have a very, very high death rate one year uh, and a very low birth rate, then that small population is much more vulnerable to extinction. It's much more likely to go extinct. And so small populations are those that are much more vulnerable to demographic stochasticity. Environmental stochasticity is a process 
by which extreme environmental effects, a cyclone, a flood, and so on, affects a particular species. Uh, and obviously, species that have small geographical ranges are more likely to be affected by environmental stresses. Uh, let's say you have a, a cyclone uh, that that uh, hits a certain part of the country, then if a species is found across the entire length and width of the country, its population is not going to be affected much by this extreme weather event. But if there is a species that is found only in the location where the cyclone hits, then that species is more vulnerable to uh, environmental stochasticity. So species that have small geographic ranges are far more vulnerable to environmental stochasticity than species that have large geographical ranges. One of the species uh, in India, an endemic species to the eastern Himalayas, is the Bogun Leochitla, which is critically endangered. As far as we know, there are only 14 to 20 birds. So it's, a, it's got a very small population size, just 14 to 20 birds that we know of in the wild. Uh, so it's vulnerable to demographic stochasticity because it has a very small population size. It's also vulnerable to environmental stochasticity because it's found only in a two square kilometer area in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. And so this is the kind of bird that would be the sixth form of rarity, small population sizes uh, in a small geographic range, uh, limited to valleys and ravines. So a habitat specialist, and therefore most vulnerable to both these forms of stochasticity, demographic and environmental. Why are birds threatened? What, what, is it, what are the various uh, forms of threats that birds face? Uh, some of these are habitat loss and fragmentation. You can see a picture of a habitat fragment, two habitat fragments on the right there, where vast tracts of forest that were contiguous are then fragmented into smaller patches that are then isolated and far away from the uh, large fragment uh, or the contiguous patches of forest. Climate change is emerging now as a particularly uh, large threat to bird populations, over-exploitation through hunting and other such ways of harvest have been important and continue to be important as threats to birds. Uh, you have invasive species, disease, toxins and pollutants and then very often these threats are not acting in isolation. It's not as if a bird is facing only habitat loss and not climate change or only invasive species and not your know, diseases. So very often these threats are acting together. And so the synergistic or the interactive effects of these threats are also very, very important to understand uh, in, in bird conservation. Let's start by looking at habitat fragmentation. Uh, this is a graph uh, which has area on the x-axis in the log scale, area of the fragment on the x-axis on the log scale, and the number of species on the y-axis. And uh, these are various fra forest fragments from the Eastern Arc Mountains in the Taita Hills of uh, Africa. And you can see that as area increases, the number of species that the fragment can hold also increases. So small fragments have fewer species, larger fragments have a greater number of species. And that's true for all species as well as for forest specialists, where smaller fragments are not able to support uh, a large number of species. That's because some species are area sensitive, you know, they need uh, larger tracts of area to be able to have uh, multiple home ranges and multiple territories. And so small fragments uh, don't allow these wide ranging species to continue to exist in these fragments. And therefore you lose especially large wide ranging species from forest fragments. Not only do you lose species uh, because of fragmentation, you also lose species interactions. Uh, these are flocks, mixed species bird flocks which are groups of uh, species that uh, feed and move together. They're tied together in a very strong network of interactions. And what happens with fra forest fragmentation is in the bottom right, you're seeing that you're not only losing species from the forest fragment, but because the fragment is isolated, because the fragment is isolated, the interactions between these species are also coming down. So what you see in the top right in that photograph there is the distance between a uh, secondary forest and a fragment which is 100 meters so that's an isolated forest fragment on the right side which is very relatively far from the secondary forest now after eight or nine years of regeneration of the forest in between these patches the isolation between the forest and the fragment comes down and because the fragment becomes less isolated after eight or nine years of regeneration which is what you see on the left over there you have these very cohesive mixed flock uh, species. 
After re-isolation of these forest patches by cutting down this secondary forest, after three years of these uh, re-isolation, the interactions between these species break down. Not only do you lose those species which have disappeared from the forest fragment, even the species that are left behind, the interactions break down until the interactions are completely absent between these species and the mixed species flock itself disappears over time from these forest fragments. So fragmentation not only affects the number of species in the habitat, it also affects the interactions, very, very important interactions between species. So for example, mixed flocks are very important for the survival of their participants participant species and the breakdown of these networks really has huge impacts on their uh, survival and their ability to persist in uh, forest fragments. A fragmentation also causes very, very interesting indirect effects. This is an example from Barrow, Colorado Island. Barrow, Colorado Island uh, was an island created by a lake that was created during the uh, construction of the Panama Canal. And uh, when the Panama Canal was created, a lot of the forest area was flooded and a little bit of the forest that was relatively high elevation then became isolated as an island uh, and it's called Barrow, Colorado Island. All the jaguars have disappeared from Barrow, Colorado Island. They're large, high trophic level animals. They lead, need large areas uh, to survive and Barrow, Colorado Island is just incapable of uh, uh, supporting jaguars. And so they've disappeared from the island. The disappearance of the jaguars has allowed what are called meso predators. In the middle, you see the ocelot and the coati and the jaguarundi. These meso predators have increased in abundance because of the absence of the jaguar. And these meso predators are also nest predators. They eat the nests of ground nesting birds. And uh, look at, if you look at the predation rates of nests on the ground, zero meters, uh, one meter above the ground and two meters above the ground, and you compare the predation rates on the mainland in green and the island in red, you see huge changes. So ground nesting birds have about a six or seven percent predation risk of their nests on the mainland, uh, whereas they have an almost 90 percent predation risk uh, of nests. 90 percent of the nests are lost from predation on the island. And that's because of the jaguar uh, absence of the jaguar. So the jaguar is not directly interacting with these birds at all. But because of fragmentation, the loss of this top predator, these intermediate predators or meso predators increase in abundance and they have actually led to the extinction of a large number of ground nesting birds from uh, Barrow, Colorado Island. And so fragmentation also causes these uh, trophic cascades, which is very, very uh, interesting indirect impacts that uh, occur leading to the loss of uh, bird species from these uh, fragments. Climate change is becoming a very, very important uh, cause for uh, threats to birds. Uh, one of the ways in which climate change is affecting uh, birds is through what are called phenological mismatches. Phenology is the timing of which annual events happen in the life cycle of, a, of, an, of an animal. So for example, migration is a phenological event. Uh, nesting is a phenological event. So here's an example of uh, the great tit from Europe. The great tit feeds on caterpillars and the laying dates of the great tit, which are around March 1st, uh, if you look at the graph on the top left there, the laying dates of these uh, great tits around March 1st, that they time the laying of their eggs such that when the chicks hatch and the chick food needs are the highest, that's when the caterpillars are also in the habitat. That's when the abundance of the caterpillars is also highest. And so the, the timing of nesting, the timing of laying eggs is matched to the timing when caterpillars are going to emerge such that when the abundance of the caterpillars is very, very high in the habitat, that's the time when the, ne the, the, the chicks are in the nest and the uh, needs of the chicks are the highest. What's happening very often with climate change is that these phenological events egg laying versus the abundance of the food in the habitat become mismatched. So if the caterpillars, if the great tits continue to lay their eggs in May, but because of climate change, the abundance of the caterpillars, though the emergence of the caterpillars comes earlier, let's say the caterpillars are using temperature to determine when to hatch from the eggs. And uh, because the habitat is getting warmer and warmer over time, they're emerging from the 
from their eggs earlier. But the great tit, if it's continuing to nest and lay eggs such that uh, when they actually hatch, the the peak in the caterpillar abundance is over. The caterpillars have emerged early. They have uh, uh, become adults earlier. And so when the chicks are in the nest and the nest uh, requirements, resource requirements in the nest are very, very high, uh, there are no caterpillars or very, very few caterpillars in the habitat. So climate change can cause these phenological mismatches between predator and prey, uh, which affect bird uh, fitness and bird uh, survival and reproductive ability. Climate change is also causing rain shifts and this is very, very apparent from uh, tropical mountains especially. This is an example from the Andes mountain range. And here you have this, uh, this particular mountain range going from an elevation of about 470 meters to, to the summit which is 1400 meters. So the mountain range itself is about 1400 meters high. Now what you're seeing at the bottom there is one bar representing different species. Each bar is a particular species and you have the elevational range of each of these species uh, shown by that bar. So the first species, for example, goes from 470 meters to about 800 meters. Now, what the gray bars are showing is the elevational range historically. If there is a green extension of the elevational range upwards, that means that the upper limit of the range of the species is moving higher up in elevation. And you see the red uh, lines. What that means is that the lower elevation, lower limit of the elevational range is uh, higher up today than it was historically. So what's happening here is that as climate is becoming warmer and warmer, birds are moving upwards in these mountains to, to adapt, to remain in similar temperatures that they are adapted to historically. So climate change is causing these birds to move upwards in these tropical mountains and from the same study what we are seeing is uh, in this graph on the x-axis is the change in the elevational extent of the range of these species for three different kinds of species lowland species mid elevation species and mountain top species lowland species are actually expanding their ranges they're moving upwards so you see that box plot there is actually mostly positive uh, to the right of zero, which means that the low elevation species are expanding their ranges upwards and increasing their elevational ranges in response to climate change. The mid elevation species are moving upwards both in their lower limit of the elevational range and the upper limit of their elevational range. And so there's hardly any change. The uh, change in elevational extent over time has mostly uh, roughly zero. The mountain top species are losing elevation. So the lower limit of their elevational ranges is moving higher up because of the because of that what is happening uh, is that they're getting squeezed at the top. They're moving upwards and a lot of these mountain top species are going locally extinct in these mountains because they, they're moving upwards and upwards and finally there's nowhere else to go. They run out of habitat and they go extinct and this has been uh, called the escalator to extinction. Uh, and this is a process that's happening in tropical uh, mountains uh, across the world where bird species are moving up in response to climate change and then uh, unfortunately going extinct. Another threat to birds is uh, overexploitation and uh, one of the classic examples of overexploitation is that of the passenger pigeon. Uh, the passenger pigeon was an extremely common uh, species of pigeon in uh, North America and uh, you know there are reports of flocks of millions of birds being miles long and miles wide. That was how common they were, but uh, they were hunted to extinction. And uh, that's how, so, you know, a very, very common species that has gone completely extinct because of hunting. And that's true for a number of other species like the Carolina parakeet, again from North America, and a number of species on islands like the uh, Rodriguez solitaire, the dodo, and the great auk that have uh, basically gone extinct because of over exploitation by human beings or uh, hunting by human beings. Toxins and pollutants like we were talking about uh, have had a massive effect on Indian vultures. Uh, the veterinary drug diclofenac that is used to inject uh, livestock that are sick. So cattle that are ill were injected with diclofenac and uh, after they die the vultures would feed on the carcasses of these uh, uh, 
dead animals, the tissues of which contain diclofenac. And because diclofenac is a toxin for these uh, vultures, the uh, vultures would die because of uh, poisoning. And the population sizes of uh, our vultures, because of this particular veterinary drug, diclofenac has declined by about 90 to 98% for different species uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, which is a massive, massive decline. All of these vultures are now critically endangered. On islands, especially invasive species take a huge toll on birds. One of the classic examples of uh, an invasive species having a massive, massive conservation implications is that of the island of Guam. The island of Guam is in the Pacific Ocean and the birds on, these, uh, on this island have evolved without predators. Uh, and so they are not adapted to escaping predators or having any anti-predator strategies. The brown tree snake uh, which was never found on the island of Guam was introduced onto this island and it is a massive predator of the nests and the eggs of these birds. And the brown tree snake, after the introduction of the brown tree snake in the 1970s, the population sizes of the number of birds like you can see on the right have crashed completely. And a lot of the endemic birds of Guam, a lot of the birds of, uh, that were found only in Guam on the island of Guam have actually now gone completely extinct because of this invasive species. The invasive species being a species that is not native uh, to that habitat. It has been introduced onto the habitat by human beings and then it has caused these massive uh, population declines. Other examples of invasive species are uh, rats and pigs. Wherever humans go, they have taken rats with them and taken pigs with them. And especially on islands where birds have not evolved in the presence of predation, uh, these birds are especially vulnerable to uh, being uh, to going extinct because of predation by pigs and rats. Disease is another example. The uh, the Hawaiian archipelago you see on the map over there on the top left is or was home to a number of honey creepers. Uh, you can see some of these honey creepers on the right there. These honey creepers were endemic to the Hawaiian Islands. They were found nowhere else in the world. And they had evolved on these islands in the absence of mosquitoes and therefore the absence of malaria. Uh, when human beings came to these islands, they brought mosquitoes with them. And uh, the mosquitoes obviously carried uh, avian malaria with them. And these birds have no immunity, had no immunity to malaria at all. And so when these mosquitoes were introduced, they uh, brought with them avian malaria and avian pox. Uh, to which these birds had no resistance, as a, a result of which malaria and po avian pox have caused the extinction of a large number of the endemic honey creepers of the Hawaiian Islands. So they have actually succumbed to uh, a disease. So disease, uh, especially on islands where birds have not evolved in the presence of such diseases and not uh, evolved any immunity to disease, uh, has also been a cause for uh, extinction of species. Islands are especially, you know, vulnerable to uh, to these kinds of effects. Birds on islands are particularly vulnerable to extinction. Uh, that's because, like I was saying, they've evolved there in the absence of, you know, things like diseases, things like predation. Uh, they've not evolved any immunity against uh, these diseases. They've not evolved any uh, behavioral responses against uh, predators. So a lot of these island birds will nest on the ground because they're not used to having predators coming and uh, destroying their nests and eating their eggs and fledglings. One, uh, one example of this is the, is the dodo from the island of Mauritius, uh, which had no fear, for example, of human beings. It was supposed to be very tame and docile because it has not evolved any fear of predators. Uh, and this is a pattern that you see with island birds repeatedly where uh, they're very, very vulnerable to predation by invasive species, very, very vulnerable to the introduction of new diseases onto these islands. And, uh, and so a lot of the extinction of birds that we see are uh, from island systems. Let's look at some of the synergistic threats where two threats are acting together to influence uh, bird species and to influence the uh, conservation of uh, bird species. This is an example from the Eastern Himalayas. What you see on the left, that photograph on the left, is uh, what is happening in the Eastern Himalayas now is that across that elevational gradient, you tend to see habitats being converted, uh, forests being lost to uh, agriculture. 
or to settlements. So there's forest degradation happening. And in the Himalayas, you also have species moving upwards because of climate change. So they're being impacted both by climate change as well as forest degradation. Now, this is work from 2000 meters, elevation of 2000 meters in the Himalayas, where you have this uh, low elevation blue species, the white-tailed robin, moving up towards 2000 meters, right? It's, uh, it's a low elevation species. Its range is represented by the blue polygon. So uh, it's found mostly below 2000 meters. That's its uh, elevational range. But because of climate change, it's moving up uh, towards 2000 meters. Now, as it's moving up, it's occupy, it's moving to more and more favorable habitat. That's, uh, and so you should see its survival rate going up at 2000 meters as it comes in from below because of climate change. And that's what's happening with the green line. You see in primary forest, the survival rate of the white-tailed robin, which was almost zero. There were hardly any white-tailed robins uh, in about 2011 uh, at 2000 meters. Today, the survival rates of the white-tailed robin have gone up to about 70%. So as they're moving up into primary forest, they're able to adapt to climate change. They're able to maintain survival rates by moving up uh, into primary forest. But if they move up into logged forest or degraded forest, which is the uh, represented by the brown uh, line there, then the survival rates are not going up as strongly. So the survival rates in logged forest as they've moved up is only about 20%. So climate change and logging or forest degradation are acting together to reduce survival rates of white-tailed robin in this case, but a large number of other bird species as well. So that's an example of two of these threats operating together to influence uh, the population viability of these species. Here is the joint impact of deforestation and the trapping of birds in Indonesia. Several bird species are trapped for the pet trade in Indonesia. So a large number of songbirds are trapped and sold in markets. Uh, in uh, the Indonesian islands, we, what you're seeing is a map of the Indonesian islands with two bird species you're seeing in A and C. The purple area, right, the purple area is the historical range of these species, according to BirdLife International. That's, that's the range size that they occupied. Within this range, within these purple lines for this leaf bird and this hornbill in A and C, let's focus on the hornbill, for example. What you're seeing is within these purple lines, you have the remnant forest in green. Now, green is in two colors, dark green and light green. Both of those represent the forest that is left behind in the area that this bird historically occupied. So deforestation has caused already the available habitat to shrink greatly uh, from historical times to today. Now, the green is in two colors. The reason for that is the trapping of these birds happens within five kilometers from the nearest access point. So anything that is five kilometers from a road, any habitat that is five kilometers from a road has been completely trapped, has been completely trapped out. The birds are absent in that, in that area. So the green parts of those dark green parts of the forest are showing you forest patches that are more than five kilometers away from a road. So those are the areas where these birds are still present because they are not being affected by trapping. Whereas the light green areas are areas where these birds have completely disappeared because of trapping. So actually, it's not only deforestation that is causing massive contractions in the ranges of these species, it, but deforestation is also encouraging trapping and increasing the area in which these birds can be trapped and therefore further shrinking the areas where these birds are still found in. So an, an example of how deforestation and trapping are operating together to really reduce the uh, population sizes of these uh, trapped species. Uh, another example is fragmentation and hunting. What you see on the x-axis is uh, the size of forest fragments. Uh, that's on a log scale. And on the y-axis, the uh, abundances of these various large bird species that are hunted in the Amazon basin. And you can see that the population sizes of these birds are much lower in forest fragments than they, uh, small forest fragments than they are in large forest fragments. As the size of the forest fragment increases, the, the uh, 
abundances of these birds or the densities of these birds also increases and that's because of hunting because if a forest is fragmented it's now more accessible to hunters so large tracts of forest are less accessible they're less people are less likely to go into those large uh, forest fragments to hunt large forest areas to hunt than they are to go into small forest fragments to hunt and therefore uh, fragmentation itself encourages further hunting uh, and so these two threats operate together uh, often fragmentation and hunting in influencing bird populations some birds and we talked about islands especially on islands this is the hawaii mamo uh, were subject to multiple threats operating together uh, they were exploited greatly for their feathers to make these ceremonial cloaks that you see on the left the emperor would wear these ceremonial cloaks made of the feathers of the hawaii so they were exploited uh, as in they were hunted for these for their feathers uh, invasives like rats diseases like malaria were brought in by human beings there has been a lot of loss of their native habitats to uh, uh, to cattle pasture for feeding cows and uh, uh, livestock there's been a lot of hunting as, uh, as well a lot of uh, destruction of the forest because of logging and all of this has come together to to make these populations smaller and more vulnerable to demographic and environmental stochasticity and ultimately you have all these various threats operating together to cause the complete extinction of the Hawaii Mama um, and island birds are particularly susceptible to these kinds of uh, uh, threats. What does this cause uh, in terms of the bird communities that are found in these areas? This is a, a century of change in bird communities in the, in the Andes mountains. So all of this is happening together in the Andes. Climate change, forest loss, hunting, et cetera, et cetera. All of these changes are occurring together and that's causing what is called biotic homogenization. Stay with me for a moment here. You have three graphs over here. Uh, these three are showing you the frequency histograms of body size, dispersal ability or mobility and habitat breadth. Uh, and compare the blue line, blue areas with the red areas. The blue areas are the new species that have come into this habitat. The red areas are the species that have gone extinct. You can see that the species that have gone extinct tend to be larger than the species that are the new species that have come into this habitat, right? The large species are going locally extinct. The species that are replacing them are smaller species. In terms of dispersal ability or mobility, the species that have gone extinct are actually species that have low dispersal ability. They're towards the left of that x-axis, right? So their species are going, the species that are going extinct are the species that are more sedentary, the species that cannot move the new species that are coming in are species that actually can move long distances. They are species that are mobile. Uh, they have high dispersal ability. And in terms of habitat specialization, the species that have gone extinct are the specialist uh, habitat, specialist species with low niche breadths or niche habitat breadths. And this new species that are coming in, the blue species are those that have higher uh, niche breadths or more generalist species. So. What's happening here is that they're moving from communities that had or were represented by a large number of species that were large, sedentary, specialist species towards communities that are becoming dominated by smaller, more mobile habitat generalist species. And that's happening because of all of these things, hunting, climate change, uh, habitat loss and degradation and so on. Uh, it's causing the homogenization of communities such that the species that are in these new communities are species that are small, mobile, and habitat generalists. Uh, from India, we have a number of uh, conservation case studies that might be of interest. Uh, for example, where you have habitat loss and fragmentation affecting bird species like the Great Indian Bustard, the Greater Edgerton Stock, uh, the Hornbills of Northeast India, rainforest birds of the Western Ghats, uh, and so on. Uh, you know, you have uh, various conservation uh, interventions that have been uh, uh, instituted to protect these bird species depending on the threats that they're facing. For example, for the great Indian mustard, captive breeding and habitat protection, for the hornbills of Northeast India, nest protection, uh, community-based nest protection and uh, forest restoration, uh, as well, same for the rainforest birds of the Western Ghats, 
uh, community based uh, habitat conservation for Himalayan birds in the eastern Himalayas uh, in response to climate change and uh, where species have been exploited in the past, Amur falcons, the edible nest swiftlet, and especially the bird trade, which is quite a large uh, uh, issue in India. Uh, what are the ways in which we can conserve these species through community-based hunting reduction, uh, uh, preventing hunting, and so on. And uh, with Indian vultures that are being exposed to toxins and pollutants, captive breeding is emerging as a way in which to replenish their wild populations. and. Uh, Toxin management, replacing diclofenac as a veterinary drug with alternative drugs so that uh, cattle carcasses are not poisoning these vultures anymore. These are certain bird conservation case studies that uh, would be of interest to people who uh, might be uh, looking for a more deep dive into the kind of uh, threats that Indian birds are facing and the kind of uh, conservation approaches that people have taken to protect these species. Thank you. 